is Gronk the Goat. More Watson updates and some words of wisdom from Mike Tomlin. All that and more on the Monday edition of Unexpected Play. All right. Hello, everybody. We are here on a Monday morning recording this. May not get out to you until Monday afternoon. Discussing all of what went into last week in the NFL as part of the Monday podcast. What we did end up having, and that's going to be the back half of the discussion here on the pod, is Gronk's retirement. Is it real? Is it not real? Will he end up coming back? After training camp into September, October, the playoff push, whatever it may be, I'm not sure. But I'm going to discuss this as if it's the real deal. We're closing the book on Gronk's career. And where does he really rank amongst the greatest of all time when it comes to tight end play? I think it's an interesting discussion. And I found a lot of data on guys going back all the way, all the Hall of Famers. So guys who were playing in the in the. 50s and 60s and there's some interesting discussions on some potentially underrated types of guys from from that era that I'm going to bring in along with Gronk and also uh, I have some stuff on Mike Tomlin that I mentioned that I'm going to get into there but before we get to that before we get to anything else let's up top talk about underdog fantasy the best place to play fantasy football this summer is underdog fantasy. Their best ball mania tournament has 10 million in total prize money, no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. We've been doing these underdog drafts as part of what the fantasy football team is doing here. So, you know, in June, you can have a million dollar team. It happens. You can double your first deposit up to a hundred dollars when you sign up with code PFF and if you play at least 10 of those dollars, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to Underdog Fantasy now. $10, promo code PFF, and your best ball mania team today. All right. So we're going to talk Watson first, since that is the newsy sort of stuff. We have some, some drip drip last week on exactly what was going on with Deshaun and then the most significant and well-sourced piece of news that I found here, and again, we had some hints that this was coming for a while, uh, Mark Maskey, who writes for the Washington Post, he's here in D.C., may have some connections to uh, the special arbitrator in this case, Sue Robinson, who's a former U.S. district judge, who's going to be talking about this. She's to be the disciplinary officer who was appointed by the league and the NFLPA to talk about this. The big news, the big scoop here is that the NFL and Watson were talking about a potential negotiated settlement here, which would then presumably avoid a, an appeal process here because the appeal process goes to Goodell. It starts with this uh, Sue Robinson, uh, Judge Sue Robinson, there's an initial ruling either side, the NFL or the NFL PA can appeal if she rules that there was a violation of the of the uh, personal conduct policy. Now, it's possible that she'll rule that there's no violation of the personal conduct policy. And if that's the case, there's nothing to appeal. The NFL cannot even uh, appeal in, in that case. But when it does get appealed, it's going to go to and Goodell is going to be the ultimate decider on that. Something where, I mean, I guess he probably wants that control. In a way, but at the same time, you know, attaching his name to anything that people are going to be upset about is not ideal in some circumstances for him. But the, the, so the big news is that the NFL and the NFL PA and Watson side with the NFL PA are very, very, very far apart on what they believe is an appropriate suspension here. It looks like the NFL wants an indefinite suspension. So he'd have to reapply. He'd have to apply to be reinstated at a at a uh, at a time in the future, and they want it to be at least a year into the future. With this, so a year would have to pass. He would have to miss the 2022 season for then to have, have the ability to apply to get back in uh, to be reinstated. That is not something that Watson and his and his side want to do. Obviously, not something the Browns probably want to happen. 
uh, they were probably expecting a maximum of eight games when they made this transaction based upon precedent of what happened with Ben Roethlisberger. And, uh, you know, that's what Watson side is going to argue on this. The precedent isn't for anything like an indefinite suspension or a year based upon this. Uh, they're also reportedly going to point to the fact that owners like Daniel Snyder, uh, Bob Kraft and Jerry Jones have not been suspended for various incidents that they've had, which have involved, you know, not sexual assault, but definitely some inappropriate behavior on the part of Kraft himself, Snyder himself. And then when it comes to Jerry Jones, uh, some people within his organization, they're going to point to all that. I don't know what's going to happen here, but it does seem to me if we look back to Maybe the New York Times piece that came out from Jenny Vrentes a few weeks back, but certainly the fact that the 24th lawsuit that came in was from someone who it seemed like Watson's legal team, maybe the Browns and others did not know that she, I don't know if did not know she existed is probably the wrong terminology, but did not know that she was even a potential uh, litigant in this, a potential accuser, a potential plaintiff uh, for a civil lawsuit. So when that happened, and again, in Jenny Vrentis's story in the New York Times, she spoke with an anonymous source, a, a new person, a new person who had not been spoken with, was not part of the legal process, either criminally or civil. And, you know, someone new popping up on the radar. I think that sent a chill down the spine of the NFL where they may have been close to, to let's say wrapping up an eight game suspension, something like that uh, going on the precedent of what's happened with Roethlisberger and others in the past. But now with new cases popping up and the word also Tony uh, Busby, the attorney for the accusers put out there that even more new cases may pop up. I think that made them say, guess what? You know, we can't have, a ruling, a suspension, and then more shoes dropping in the future. There is a statute of limitations on a lot of the stuff that happened in 2020 that will run out over the next year for a lot of people. So I think their, their thought is let's make this indefinite so that the statute of limitations will, will end on these civil cases. No more civil cases will be brought. We'll have a great idea of exactly where we stand a year from now. And then he can reapply to, to get back in. But if something really, really bad comes out between now and then, we have the ability to lean even further into a longer suspension and not reinstate him in a year. That seems to be of what happened. And again, this is a change, I believe, on what all expectations were going into the Deshaun Watson quote unquote sweepstakes that happened. Um, okay. So, so, so how should we be thinking about this? You guys are, you know, you're well-versed if you listen to this podcast of what I think about his guilt or innocence or the appropriate of the punishment, you know, I'm not going to be against a longer punishment in this circumstance from that perspective, from the Browns perspective. I don't know. In some ways this might be better for them. Uh, if he's out for a year, uh, people will kind of forget about it. People will definitely think that he has served, his his time probably most people will think he has had a harsh enough penalty based upon this and from a pure dollars and cents perspective you know they they signed him to this extension that was going to last through the 2027 season i believe so now if he misses the entire year that contract just shifts just ships down a year so there's a lot made of the fact that he had such a low cap number and salary in 2000 in 22 in this season so that now becomes the 2023 number so it's a very low cap number for watson it'll give them the browns a more competitiveness competitiveness next year where his cap number was uh supposed to jump jump up to above 50 million so he'll still have that low cap number next year and they have this team you know built to compete now or over the next few years with a lot of the different contracts that they have so not not the worst outcome. Now, having Jacoby Brissett start for the year, and it will be Jacoby Brissett, not Baker Mayfield. Having Jacoby Brissett start for a year, not ideal. But I'm warming a little bit more to the fact that this type of offense, play action, good offensive line, you can hold the ball a little bit longer. That's really been Brissett's Achilles heels. He holds the ball way too long. He's not a bad thrower of the football. 
but he just holds the ball a lot and takes a lot of sacks. This is an offense where maybe you can get away with a little bit more of that than you could playing for Miami most recently where they had the, one of the worst offensive lines in the NFL and you had to get rid of the ball so quickly to even have a chance there. This will give him a little bit more of an opportunity to do that. They can run the ball. He can run the ball. Okay. Uh, I don't know if the Browns could sneak into the playoffs, but I think they could at least be competitive this year with Brissett, who, you know, he looked okay, and he was somewhat competitive with the Colts at the beginning of the season. They started off kind of hot back in 2019 when he was the when he was the quarterback there when Andrew Luck suddenly retired. So there's some possibility here. From it wouldn't be again. I don't think it would be the worst thing for, for for the Browns. But what they have been doing is they've been giving Deshaun Watson, you know, all the reps in the offseason program, and that would obviously shift a lot. And as far as timing is concerned on this. There's a hearing on Tuesday. They're going to do another hearing where Watson, with Watson on Tuesday with the disciplinary officer. There is no timeline on exactly when a decision will, will come out. But uh, sources on this Washington Post story by Mark Maskey say that they would want to have it decided before training camp. So training camp, the first full practice involving veteran players for the Browns is july 27th so we're still talking about a month from now potentially this this could this could go out for and i know there was a there was a kind of semi story with the fact that watson reached settlement with 20 of the 24 cases i don't know it seems very incomplete to me if it was 24 of 24 cases i think that would be a big deal here i just don't think it really affects that much going on here you still have four cases that's just, that's not, you know it's a material amount of cases maybe There'll be a second settlement with those before they actually end up going to trial. But if those end up going to trial in these civil trials, you know, it's messy, it's out there. And if he somehow was able to negotiate down to something like an eight game suspension, you're going to have a lot of this hanging in the background the entire time. And it won't be great PR wise for the Browns or for anyone else. So maybe if you're the Browns, you're not you're, you're not that disappointed by the year long suspension especially with the contract moving down and having that favorable cap situation next year. So we shall see. I'm sure we'll hear more and more on what's going to go on this week. And a lengthy suspension seems very, very likely, I think, at this point, because I just don't know in whose benefit it is other than Deshaun Watson and maybe the Browns benefit to have anything less than the initial ruling be a, a year suspension. And potentially indefinite suspension. You know, I, I don't see any PR or reputational damage to the NFL if they if they lean into a longer suspension here versus leaning into a shorter suspension. All right, before we get to the next section of the program here, let me just tell you, you can get 25% off any PFF subscription if you use code UNEXPECTED. What do you get? You get the locked article content. I have my breakout wide receiver series coming out right now. You're going to get all of the fantasy projections, all of the fantasy uh, rankings that we have for everyone. We have a whole new layout that is going to be this year. A lot more in information in terms of blurbs and other things that I think you guys are going to enjoy a lot. And of course, you're getting all the other PFF data, all the grades, all the signature stats, everything else there. 25% off promo code unexpected. Go get it today at pff all right next thing we're going to talk about here for those who did not see it i shared some stuff on my timeline about an interview that mike tomlin had excellent 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 interview i suggest everyone check it out on youtube or on their podcast apps the podcast is called the pivot it is hosted by three former nfl players ryan clark who of course played for mike tomlin for a number of years uh for the pittsburgh steelers Fred Taylor, uh, is Fred Taylor in the Hall of Fame? Let me, let me look it up here. I was going to say Hall of Famer, but I don't think he is. He's one of those guys who probably people think is like should be on the edge of Hall of Fame. No, no, he's not in the Hall of Fame. But Fred Taylor, one of the best running backs of you know his era, certainly. Uh, explosive, real explosive dude. Um, he might be one of the best running backs not in the Hall of Fame, quite honestly. So, so Fred Taylor hosts this. And then also Channing... Um, Channing Crowder wasn't as familiar with Channing. I mean, I knew him as a player back in the day. He was a linebacker for a number of years. So these three guys, they host this podcast, The Pivot. They bring on a bunch of different guests and they had Tomlin here. And, you know, you really get a great idea of why Mike Tomlin 
is such a good coach. You could point to the luck of coming into Pittsburgh and essentially being tied at the hip with Ben Roethlisberger for almost his entire coaching career. But still, you know, the Super Bowl, the the W's that they got along the way, uh, that sort of stuff, you can't discount that. And then now we have also seen when Roethlisberger hasn't been playing, when he got injured last year, a competitive team, a really good coaching job. And I think this is going to be an exciting coaching job for him going forward this year. He talks about that in the podcast. He talks about the relationship with Antonio Brown also. I love this positivity. Excuse me. I love this positivity about these things. I loved how he leans into what's what's good about these people. And while he's willing to discuss people's flaws, he does so in a very humanizing and empathetic sort of way, which I thought was fantastic. And the guy just oozes leadership and you want to run through a run through a wall for him. But, you know, the stories about uh, working for Tony Dungy and others were fantastic. Uh, but I really wanted to highlight here was a response he had to a question on why he thought that he still had to prove himself. Again, I said the resume is as decorated as any um, current head coach minus, you know, Bill Belichick or someone like that. Why does he feel like he continues to need to prove himself? And that's when he went into this, this concept of not wanting to seek comfort. Uh, I'm going to play a clip here of Tomlin talking about this, and then I'll get into why I think this is so interesting and maybe even uh, an angle on how to think about this in the context of looking at contextual stats and things like that for what, what went on in a game. But here is, here's Tom Lund talking about why he's not going to sit back and say, look back and say why he is one of the greatest coaches there. He can't view things that sort of way. He can't lean back and look at the resume. I resist comfort. Um, I ask my guys to resist comfort, right? Guys that played for me, they can tell you one of my sayings. I got a lot of sayings is um, don't seek, don't seek comfort. Seeking comfort is a natural human condition, right? We all want to be comfortable. Um, I realize if you're going to have special outcomes, that you got to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And so I've just trained myself over the years to resist comfort. And, and so appreciating my resume is seeking comfort. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get my ass whooped and I say, huh, but, I, but my resume is such and such. I'm still a Super Bowl champ. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's seeking comfort. Yeah. Like, those that love us most in our business, they do the best job of helping us seek comfort, right? I come into this house, man, and I lose a home game, and my mama's sitting in the kitchen, and she talking about the refs did us wrong, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Ma, get out of here with that. I don't need that. It stings my ears. I've trained myself to hate it. Um because hating it keeps me upright, keeps our program upright. Um, that's just the mode of operation that I'm comfortable with. I mean, again, yeah, I don't know how you can listen to Tomlin and not, you know, want to want to play for this guy, want to work with this guy, want to just hang out with this dude. I want to hang out down in Tomlin's uh, basement down there on those nice leather chairs and just and just talk to this dude for a while. Um, but why I thought this was interesting, the comfort thing, seeking comfort thing, is that I have thought a lot about when we are looking at performance from this analytical perspective, one of the biggest things that is a difference between how we may view things versus how you know coaches or other football guys may 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 view things is we have a healthy i believe appreciation for variance for luck and there becomes a thin line though and i can see why from from mike tomlin's perspective when he says he doesn't want to hear that he doesn't want to hear about luck probably especially if you're talking about poor performance, poor results, I should say, and saying, well, you know, 
there's there's a good chance that this is due to luck. He doesn't want to hear about that. He wants to be able to control what he can control. He can't get caught up in those things. And I think that's important lesson for even us nerds to realize is that while you want to talk about variants, you want to talk about how much luck plays into things. You want to talk about the instability of things. You want to talk about how things, some things are out of our control and we shouldn't just read the results as the only holy grail as to what reality is. At the same time, we don't want to lean into that. We don't want to be able to use that as an excuse to then foster an opinion, a narrative, an excuse for what we want, for what we believe, for what we already believed going into it. I think that's important. It's important to make sure, am I really being balanced here? And probably leaning against even in a way, if we think, you know, we think quarterback X is not as good as some others and then he has a great game you know don't just lean into saying well it's one game there's a lot of variance going on here uh you know a few plays you flip it around he wouldn't have been as good well all that could be true and it could be the actual underlying fact having a healthy appreciation for not using it as a crutch in your in your analysis not using it as a mask over what could be a poor call, a poor prediction, a poor result for what you were believing in going into an event. Don't use that sort of thing. I think that's what I thought of when I was thinking of, of, of Mike Tomlin talking about this. And I also had a second, secondary, a little bit opinion on this is how this may apply to kind of life more generally. And especially, I know I'm a little bit social media obsessed, but uh, especially life on social media, there is a lot of comfort seeking on social media when it comes to complaining about the refs, when it comes to for certain teams, people love to share that stuff. Um, even a lot of kind of the outrage manufacturing about whatever the, the subject du jour may be, in a way that's seeking comfort because you're saying, Look at how right I am. You're kind of like reinforcing your own righteousness versus the the other wrongness of the other person. And not only are they wrong, they're just a, they're just an awful person. So you're you're feeling more comfortable in your own opinion on things. But I think what we learn is that by seeking this comfort on a temporary basis, it gives us some sort of relief. It gives us some sort of exhale maybe on a very temporary basis this this feeling this psychic feeling of being right of being able to excuse away things that didn't go our way to have someone else to blame for it is the reps it's the other side of this you know political divide it's uh these people it's the nfl it's the poor coaches who don't know what they're doing whoever it may be there when you're rooting for a particular team or you're on again in some sort of social or, or political issue. But then the more and the more you lean into that, the more dissatisfied you become because you kind of lose your agency for what, for what you're doing. You're, 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 you're excusing away so many things and getting so much comfort, but then you're losing your, you're just like, why, why care? Right. If everything is decided by someone else, if there's all these evil forces out there to get you, then why care? you've lost your agency in thinking about how you're going to, how you're going to work going forward. And I feel like that's another important point, kind of a, a life point that Tomlin goes through here. And again, if you listen to his podcast and I suggest that you do, uh, you know, he's just dropping nuggets. He's just dropping wisdom nuggets after wisdom nugget from Tomlin here. But I thought this point about seeking comfort and wanting to resist that and always wanting to be uncomfortable with what you're, feelings, your your predictions, again, when it comes to uh, statistical things, the results that have come through, you got to sit with that, sit with that for a little bit first before immediately discounting things out because of randomness, because of variance, because of external forces that are holding you down. Um, re resist that more and more. And I'm going to be thinking about that not only when it comes to, again, the results cards coming through for the NFL season in my analysis, but being able to decode whether I've done a good job 
or not on different analysis in the past and not just write off, you know, Matthew Stafford being the top EPA per play quarterback in the NFL last year when I was thinking that he was a little bit overrated going to the season, maybe not just writing that off as, Hey, variance happens. You couldn't have seen it coming, everything else and leaning a little harder into not seeking that sort of comfort and being more critical in your own self evaluation. All right, before we get into the GOAT tight end discussion and Gronk, which I think you guys are going to enjoy, I did quite a bit of research on this. We're going to talk about our last sponsor, and that is Manscaped. Gentlemen, all men strive for gold in their life, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold everything. I'm not a big gold fan myself, but anyway. However, there is a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with the confidence of an eagle and giggles in the face of danger. He's big, hairless winning machine and when he unzips his pants he sees platinum that's right manscaped would like to introduce you to their best and biggest ultimate hygiene bundle yet the platinum package 4.0 manscaped is the leader in below the waist grooming now trust them with the whole shebang join 4 million men worldwide who trust manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20 percent off and free shipping with code pff manscaped's brand new platinum package 4.0 is the biggest bundle they've ever offered giving you a bulk discount on Manscaped's top products. Get 20% off and free shipping with code PFF and manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping and manscaped.com and use code PFF. It's time you enjoy the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. All right. For those who, you know, weren't asleep over last week, Gronk out. Gronk has now announced his retirement. Now he did retire and take a season off before coming back. Um, last year so we can you know take it for what it's worth he may come back again but I'm going to assume Gronk is out here and now we got to figure out because everything's about ranking right life you, you got to rank everything in life uh, in order to get that engagement is Gronk the goat I think is an interesting question and I decided I would investigate into this with some statistics as I, as I like to do, but our PFF data only goes back to 2006. That's when we've been collecting all of the per play grading signature stats, everything else. So 2006. So we're going to miss out when we're talking about a goat discussion. I know it's weird to compare players from different eras. So I thought, well, how can we realistically compare, you know, Rob Gronkowski, Kelsey, other modern tight ends to guys who played in 14 game seasons back in the day. And the average NFL offense was passing for, you know, on 2,500 yards where now it's closer to 4,000 yards. How do we, how do we compare this sort of, these sort of guys? Um, so I went to our friends at pro football reference and uh, did a little scrapey scrape there where I have something set up here to get all of the information, not only for the players who I wanted to put in this analysis, so getting all of their receiving numbers, but then also for the years of the different eras. So the average passing offense in terms of yards and touchdowns from about 1950 until today, every season. So I can kind of normalize based upon a season. You know, if someone has a thousand yards receiving, that would be a much different percentage of the average passing offense in that era than it would be, you know, it, it would be in 1960 than it would be today. So that's how I thought about doing this. And I grabbed as part of the analysis, all of the current Hall of Fame tight ends. So I said, okay, let's let's figure out who we're going to uh, compare here. So I'm going to grab the Hall of Famers. I grab the information for Gronk, who will be a Hall of Famer, but again, to compare compare him there. Other likely Hall of Famers, like Antonio Gates, who I do not believe, you know, he 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 lasted a pretty long time there. He is he's not currently in the Hall of Fame. I think he'll get in. Uh, Tony Gonzalez got into the Hall of Fame not that long ago, so he's part of this. And then I grabbed Jason Witten, who, you know, I think will make the Hall of Fame, but I'm not, you know, I'm not too hot. I'm not, I'm not too hot on Witten. That, that's for sure. 
And again, I mentioned Travis Kelsey will be part of this. So the other names here, the other guys who are currently in the Hall of Fame at tight end, Mike Ditka, John Mackey. That's right. Uh, for those who are uh, fans of Evan Silva, as I am, the MFN Mackey Award for best uh, collegiate tight end is, in fact, named after John Mackey. Uh, Jackie Smith, that's a name to think about because he's a guy a lot of people don't know about, but I want to talk about him. Uh, Jackie Smith, Charlie Sanders, Dave Casper, Kellen Winslow, Ozzie Newsome, Shannon Sharp. And again, I mentioned Tony Gonzalez. So Tony Gonzalez, those are the guys who are in the Hall of Fame right now. So I have all these guys in this analysis. And to, to keep in mind, again, where the opinion may be on who the GOAT tight end potentially could be, I think a good frame of reference here is the NFL 100. If you remember, they came out with the 100 you know, greatest players in the history of the NFL as part of the 100th anniversary. And they chose one, two, three, four, five tight ends made the NFL 100. And they are Ditka, John Mackey, Kellen Winslow, Tony Gonzalez, and Rob Gronkowski. Those are the guys that made it. So those are probably really like, if you're going to talk about a further shaping based upon public opinion, uh, knowledgeable football analyst opinion, who the greatest may be. Gronk's part of that group, but there are four other names there. Okay, so again, so in this analysis, what I did was I took every season for all of these different tight ends. I had their receiving yards and their touch and the receiving touchdowns. We don't have target information for guys prior to, I don't know when it is on here. Um, I could just throw out a guess, but we only have, you know, if you go back decades we, for the sixties and seventies, we don't really have target information, or at least for the sixties, we don't have target information. So I didn't put targets as part of this. Um, so we looked at that and then also using that and knowing how many receptions they had, I also wanted to look at their efficiency as a catcher. Uh, again, we don't have yards per target, which would be a great measure of, of determining, you know, how many yards you think you can get when you're spending a down throwing the ball to this player, which is one way to think about the cost here. Now you earn targets. So yards per target isn't necessarily the best measure of seeing who is good or not. But I think if you look at the absolute numbers, if guys are putting up similar absolute receiving yards, similar absolute receiving touchdowns. And one is doing it on way fewer targets than the other. I think the person who's doing it on fewer targets, fewer receptions, generally those go hand in hand if the catch rates are similar. The guy who's using fewer downs to do it, they're spending fewer downs when throwing to him to accumulate the same production. I think that's more valuable. So that, that's going to be also a tipping point in this discussion. So I have the receiving yards, I have the receiving touchdowns, I have the yards per reception, and I have the touchdowns per reception for all these different players from every season in their career. Then I normalize it by the year that they played. And I say in this year that they played, what percentage of an average team's passing offense would they have accounted for? So what percentage of an average team's passing yards would their reception yards have accounted for? What percentage of an average team's receiving touchdowns would, I mean, passing touchdowns would their receiving touchdowns have accounted for. And the same thing, normalizing versus the average yards per reception, the average touchdowns per reception in that particular year. Now, yards per, per reception, it was, it's not a lot longer now than it's been in the past. Uh, yards per target has gone up quite a bit, but that's mostly a function of increasing catch rates, increasing completion percentage than it is a function of longer receptions. It's just fewer incompletions as moved up the yards per target, the efficiency passing. The yards per reception actually has been, it was a little bit higher back in the day than, than it was now for, for a lot of players. Okay, so another decision that I had to make as part of this was how do you judge longevity versus peak play. Um, and for a lot of guys, including Gronk and some of the older players, you really don't have more than eight, seven or eight great years to go on. Not everyone is 
the Tony Gonzalez of the world who played 17 NFL seasons and has the, you know, the, the accumulated the, the best numbers ever, the most receiving yards ever at tight end. Not everyone was that number. So eight seemed to be a pretty good sweet spot for looking at enough to have a Hall of Fame resume if you have eight really good years. So I wanted to compare the best years. So looking at the years for each of these players, the top eight seasons they had where they had accumulated the largest percentage of an average team's passing offense. And going through it, I was pretty surprised by some of these, some of these numbers. Um, because if we're talking about Gronk potentially being the GOAT, it does not come into play as much when we look at absolute production. If you look at his top eight seasons and you say percentage of the of an average team's offense in these years, and I'm I'm also adjusting for games missed and everything else. So this is not like penalizing for the fact that Gronk in these eight seasons ended up missing about 15, 20% of the games. Um versus again, Tony Gonzalez like never missed. I think he missed two games in his 17 season NFL career. Um so, but I'm adjusting for that. So if you look at the percentage of an average NFL offense, how much do they account for with their receiving yards? Uh, the number one guy over eight seasons is Jackie Smith at around 32%. Again, Jackie Smith is a guy, and I think he may be one of the most underrated players now that I've gone through this analysis. He didn't make the NFL 100. He's a Hall of Famer, but he did not make the NFL 100. And not only did he not make the, the, the final, final NFL 100, the final 100 players, but when they came out with the finalist for the NFL 100, there were 12 finalists at tight end, which they narrowed down to five for the actual NFL 100. When they had this 12 finalists, again, 12 finalists is bigger. You know, there's only eight Hall of Fame tight ends right now. 12 finalists. He wasn't even in the finalists, Jackie Smith. So he's, you know, really forgotten as far as uh, a lot of NFL analysis is concerned. But from a pure receiving yards perspective, there was no tight end over this eight year window, the strongest eight years. There was no tight end who accounted for more receiving yards versus, you know, he was the strongest receiver in receiving yards of any of these hall of fame level tight ends at 32%. Uh, Tony Gonzalez is next at 31 and a half percent. Again, this is only his top eight seasons. Uh, he accumulated a ton over, over the rest of his career. Um, and if you want to get like a number or more of an absolute basis on some of this, Tony Gonzalez, again, top eight seasons. He played 99.2% of the games during those seasons. Cause again, he only missed two games in his career. He averaged 1,041 receiving yards and 6.75 touchdowns in those seasons at 12 yards per reception. Okay. Next is Gronk. So Gronk is third. He's up there, but he's not number one. He's below Tony Gonzalez and he's right above Travis Kelsey and Antonio Gates in this measure at a little bit over 30%. And again, he missed time in a lot of these seasons. So his averages are much, much lower because he missed so much more time. So he was <clears throat> in these top eight seasons, he averaged around 940 yards receiving, but almost nine touchdowns. And that includes missing 20% of the games there. So he's, he's third there. If we're going to keep on going down the list, Kelsey, Antonio Gates are over 30%. Kellen Winslow. Kellen Winslow actually only even qualifies for seven seasons because he's, he doesn't have the extended career there. He's under a little bit under 30%. Then Shannon Sharp, uh, Jason Witten, Ozzy Newsom, Casper, Ditka, and then John Mackey is, is, is near the bottom here. If you go to touchdowns, and this is the Gronk. This is the Gronk zone here, scoring touchdowns. Um, you would figure that Gronk would be number one, right? And he has a very, very healthy 43% of the average teams receiving touchdowns that he had in these top eight seasons of his career. That's a healthy number. But guess what? Antonio Gates, 45.8%, even higher. And, you know, this is somewhat of a quarterback-driven stat. Gates played with Rivers. Gronk played with Tom Brady his entire career. You know, Tony Gonzalez now, the other is someone else who many people might consider the GOAT here. He is down at one, two, three, fourth. So he's below Dave Casper next. And then we have Tony Gonzalez. Uh, and then Winslow and others. And so the thing 
here again, when we talk about Jackie Smith, and I'm going to talk about how underrated this guy is, he's last in his touchdown production, but th- he just had really, really hor- horrible quarterback play. Um, so if we're going to, if we're just going to look straight up and let's say Tony Gonzalez versus Rob Gronkowski for, for goat, which some people may have that as kind of being like a potential goat status here. We have in the receiving yard category, we have Gonzalez slightly higher than Gronk, even in these peak seasons, as far as how much he's putting up. And then for touchdowns, Gronk significantly higher than Tony Gonzalez, but playing with Tom Brady. Where Gronk shines, this is this is this is where Gronk truly shines, is when you start turning to the efficiency stuff. So I'm looking at like as a percentage of the average yards per reception during their career. So Gronk, he averaged almost 16 yards per reception during these these top seasons, which is number one amongst anyone in their adjusted number about 150%, so 1.5 times the average yards per reception. That's how much he was putting up. So each time that he was catching the ball, he was getting about 50% more yards than the average during his playing time. Number one. But Jackie Smith, number two. Jackie Smith is a beast. 17 yards uh, per reception. Jackie, Jackie Smith is number two. And then, you know, Once we start getting Tony Gonzalez here, he's down near the middle end of it. He, his yards per reception is about a, is about, you know, 1.2 to 1.1 times the average yards per reception, whereas Gronk is more 1.5. And when we come up to touchdowns versus average, Gronk is almost scoring twice as many touchdowns as you would expect from any receiver per reception. And Antonio Gates is very, very close. Gates is another guy where, man, I look at this and I say, this guy's this dude, this dude is underrated a bit because I don't think he's anywhere close to being in the discussion for GOAT or being as good as Tony Gonzalez. But I'm, I mean, I'm not sure. The dude scored was a scoring machine as far as what he was able to do. Uh, during these top eight seasons, he he was averaging just as many receiving touchdowns as Gronk during an era where there were, you know, he's a little bit earlier era for some of these seasons too. So real, real studly numbers from, from Gates here, which I think puts him in the conversation, probably not for goat, but again, he's someone who's left off of the NFL 100 team, whereas Gonzalez and, and Gronkowski are in there. So I think it's that part though. The efficiency part is what put Gronks over the top versus someone like Gonzalez, because they're just such a huge contrast between these two players. I mean, let's think about it. Uh, Gronk only had 9,300 total receiving yards in his career, whereas Tony Gonzalez had over 15,000. Gronk played 143 games, uh, Tony uh, regular season games. Tony Gonzalez played 270, so almost twice as many games in his career. And huge contrast there, huge contrast in the playoffs. And this is another area where Gronk totally shines here. 22 playoff games, one 1,400 receiving yards and 15 touchdowns. So he's basically got a season's worth uh, in the playoffs and a hugely strong season, 1.4 thousand, you know, 1,400 yards and 15 touchdowns. Whereas Gonzalez in the playoffs, seven games is all he played, 250 yards, four touchdowns. And again, the contrast playing with Brady versus playing Tony Gonzalez had got most of his... The most targets from anyone he got from Trent Green over five seasons, but then the other quarterbacks he played with, Elvis Gerbach, Rich Gannon, uh, declining Rich Gannon, Damon Heward, uh, Tyler Thigpen, and Matt Ryan. But at this point, that was the last five seasons of Gonzalez's career, and he was already 33 years old before he got to Atlanta. And that's the same age that Gronk is right now, retiring. So, you know, you can explain somewhat the fact that Gronk on a yards per target basis was 9.7 yards per target and Tony Gonzalez was only 7.8. But again, talking about the underratedness of Antonio Gates, 8.5 yards per target in an era where it has to be adjusted up a little bit there. And he he missed some games, but he played 16 seasons. He had 12,000 receiving yards, Uh, 12 games in the playoffs for not great numbers there, but 540 yards and a couple of touchdowns there too. 
Uh, Travis Kelsey, does he have a chance at GOAT status? I don't think so, but 9.1 yards per target is pretty substantial and good numbers that he's doing there. And again, like I said, he's getting close on the receiving yard basis. Maybe if he can have another huge couple of seasons, it'll be interesting for him. Uh, I mean, he's, I think he's going to get into the Hall of Fame for sure, but I don't know if he'll really have a credible GOAT case since it took him so much longer to get going. Let's remember, he's almost basically a little bit younger than Gronk right now. Um, so he's already hitting 33 years old, a potential age curve in the in, in the near, near future. So I would say for Gronk and GOAT, yes, I'm making him the GOAT because he has the blocking on top of that for these guys. He's not going to be blocking on the same level. The other guys were capable blockers. He has the blocking. He has the statistical numbers as far as the absolute production in those top eight seasons, which puts him there. And then he's just head and shoulders above in a combination of how he stretched the field uh, as a tight end and how he was also a scoring threat. And if you think about it, like the way to generate additional expected points added is big plays, big explosive plays. He gave you that. And it is converting touchdowns rather than kicking field goals and he definitely gave you that also just the whole whole package there and the Brady thing yeah I think that's a that's a definitely a factor versus Gonzalez having played with such poor quarterback play over his whole career but if you look at the Brady numbers if you do the with or without Gronkowski on the field what he type of quarterback he was and there are conflating you know confounding factors here that that are going to make a a big difference here. So you want to take it with a grain of salt. You always take on off splits with a grain of salt, but Gronk missed enough games and in enough different seasons where you could get a better understanding. And you saw in each one of these seasons where he missed substantial time, Brady's numbers dropped significantly without him. Brady's numbers without Gronk in his career. It's more like Kirk Cousins type of numbers, which, you know, Kirk Cousins numbers are actually pretty good. So <laughs> it's more like a Kirk Cousins type of numbers versus with Gronk. It is MVP numbers. So you can discount somewhat the efficiency that Gronk had because he was playing with Brady. But at the same time, he showed and I think we all saw on the field the effect that he had that he was elevating the game. It was not, you know, Brady bringing him along as much as maybe the other way, the other way sometimes. So if I'm going to rate them, I'm going to put Gronk as the GOAT. I'm going to put Gonzalez as close, but I give a little bit less credit to accumulators than others. I think Gates should be seen as almost a near equivalent to Tony Gonzalez. He's really someone that we forgot about a lot there. And as far as the older players are concerned, you know, you can't argue against Dicka, Mackey, and Winslow and the type of numbers they were putting up there. Winslow maybe a little bit of a discount to some of what he did because when he was playing with Dan Fouts and that Chargers offense, you know, the team was passing for 47, 4,800 yards and 30 plus touchdowns in an era where the average team was a little bit over 3000 yards passing and maybe 20 touchdowns. So we had a little bit of advantage there that I discount a bit. And again, Jackie Smith, this guy was a stud many seasons. Look at, he had one season where he had 1,200 receiving yards and nine touchdowns in an era where in a year when the average team had fewer than 2,500 passing yards. So he's almost accounting for half of the average NFL's offense, not playing with great quarterback play, playing on teams that were not that successful. And I think that's why he's been forgotten a lot, as opposed to someone like John Mackey, who played at the same exact time, was a high draft pick, went to the Baltimore, Baltimore Colts, played with... Um, you know, played for a team that was consistently making the playoffs, had the ability to win championships, go to the very end uh, quite often. You know, it's just a it's just a different type of setup for him playing in a similar era where I think we remember that and we remember him a lot there because of the team and how strong it was, you know, Johnny Unitas, who at the time was the greatest quarterback ever, who still is probably in the conversation for being the greatest quarterback ever played all these seasons with Johnny Unitas when he was there uh, might be a little bit, you know, I don't want to say overrated, but versus someone like Jackie Smith, I'm just not quite sure he's really on this other plane for Mackey and Ditka and Winslow. Uh, Jackie Smith probably belongs also in that conversation. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this 
goat discussion on tight ends and the over underrated guys. I may start doing some more of this when it comes to quarterback play. Cause I was talking about Dan Marino the other day and people seem to enjoy some of the back and forth on that. So that could also be a place that I end up looking at, but I'm going to come at you later this week. The interview is a little bit in flux right now, but hopefully we'll have an interview for later this week. And until then, we'll see what happens on the Deshaun Watson side. We'll see what happens with the news so far here. If you have any comments, you can always email me at kevin.cole at pff.com or leave a comment. YouTube in particular, I'll end up checking and suggesting this. Any suggestions for the pod, any suggestions for guests and so on. I am more than happy to feel those and potentially act on them. But until then, I'll be talking at everyone Later this week.